how does one become aware of having FOMO, about having FOBO, which we're, we're saying is more dangerous? How does one combat uh, that likely ill that we, we will encounter in our age, and especially in this very lucky, unfortunate group, like you mentioned, that will have a lot of different career, personal, entertainment, et cetera, choices? Yeah, which is it, the whole point of the book is really about, it's about how to be decisive. And I think, you know, one of the things that I would say is that these are uh, afflictions of affluence, right? So one thing that I think all of us felt during pandemic and lockdown is maybe the FOBO and the FOMO changed in different ways because your option set changed as well. Um, however, I think it's very important to recognize, number one, that part of... Uh, part of identifying FOMO and FOBO is being somewhat self-aware. If you spend all of your time uh, compulsively searching uh, on LinkedIn and other social networks to see what other people are doing, if you feel a deep sense of stress around the fact that you wanna do three things in one night, you try to do them all, you know, that, that's, that's kind of cluing into your FOMO. If you, um, if you are delaying decision-making, pushing off, spending way too much time on things that are really not important, you know, whether you should um, stay at one of three hotels that are all sort of the same on your, on your trip, uh, if people are complaining about you, um, oh, flaking on them, uh, which mm -hmm. is something we see people, you know, they, they, one thing that, that really drives me crazy and there's a clear sign of FOBO is trying to make plans with people and they won't commit. Those types of things, if you can be aware of your own behavior and how you're directing your energy, but also listen to the people in your life and what they're telling you, people tell you that they're frustrated with you in these different ways. You may not have the word FOMO or FOBO for it, but as you start listening to the data points that are coming in, you can start to identify patterns of behavior. Um, and, and it's important because, you know, I, I have a, a person in my life that I know that has serious FOBO. FOBO, everything from sort of what to eat for dinner, all the way to uh, somebody, this person dated somebody for 15 years and wasn't able to event, you know, commit towards um, sort of a marriage, uh, despite the other person's desires. I mean, and there's a pattern of behaviors goes through to everything in this person's life. And, you know, it, I think he, he, he would have been served by people stepping up and helping him to work through it. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Hmm. Understood. Understood. So some, someone like that, you're saying one of the ways to break that cycle is for that person to get input. Uh, what if what if the person isn't aware, is just completely oblivious, people aren't giving input? I suppose they could see the signs that you're suggesting. Assuming they now know they have they have a major case of FOBO, what do they do? Yeah, so if let's deal with FOBO first. So FOBO, um, listen, there's there's the little things in life, which probably take up as much as much time as the big ones, but really the stakes are incredibly low. And so the whole point of my TED talk, which which came out uh, 2019. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was called How to Make Faster Decisions. It's about overcoming indecision on things that don't really matter. And that the classic example is like, okay, um, should I, you know, should I go to the gym today or should I not go to the gym today? Well, it doesn't really matter. You won't even remember sort of thinking about this in a day or two, but people can spend a lot of time on in inconsequential decisions. Like, mm -hmm. I just bought like plates for my new house. And it's like, you know, you're, you're on the website. It's like, there's a thousand types of, I mean, it's overwhelming. It's like, which one are you gonna buy? Uh, and so what I tend to do is with the, the things that don't really matter, like, should I have the chicken or the fish? I, I use a technique that I've been using for over 20 years called ask the watch. I take my watch, left mm -hmm. side is the chicken, the right side is the fish. I look down and see where the second hand is and the decision is made for me. Because the reality is I make most of those decisions anyway without having to think about it. But when I get stuck on a decision that has no financial implication, uh, no sort of long-term implications, and that I'll forget in a couple of days, I know that that is, an, that is basically what I call a no stakes decision. And I outsource that like almost like flipping a coin. When I have a low stakes decision, like buying the, the dishes, like the low stakes decision is something like, you know, it, it, I'll remember making that decision in a month. I'm going to use these things. It is, a, you know, it's a, an investment of some money, um, but I just don't feel equipped. You know, it's like, I look at, to me, they're all the same, right? I, 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 I call that it. You make that decision wrong. Right. I mean, it won't make it hurt me, but at the same time, I'm still stuck. I want to make a smart decision, but I'm stuck and I can't move forward. There with a low stakes decision, I outsource it. So for example, buying these new dishes, I thought of three people that I knew that I thought had decent taste and I sent them the options and then I asked them to choose for me and they did and I ordered them. And so it's really about outsourcing things that 
the end of the day, you're sort of like indifferent. Um, if you really had a strong viewpoint, you would just select it. But when you're indifferent, that's where you can get stuck. With the big things, that's where you need to work. Is when you're deciding things that have long-term implications, financial implications, life implications, where you have a lot of options and you're stuck, that's where you need to go through a process of sort of due diligence. You need to sort of uh, have this sort of like this approach whereby you force yourself to choose a, a, a front runner because at this point you're sort of indifferent, right? But you force yourself to choose one based on just sort of gut. And then you compare that front runner to each other criteria based on, you, you, you need to have set some criteria and do some research. And then you force yourself to eliminate one and choose the better. And in doing that, you are choosing something that is better. You're forcing yourself to do it and you eliminate the other one forever. And that fixes the problem you have with FOBO, which is that you keep going back to the same set of options without eliminating any of them. And that is the pathology when we feel FOBO. And if you read the, the, the work of like uh, Barry Schwartz, who wrote the, the, he wrote the Paradox of Choice, that's very much from his, his work. And so as you do that, you eliminate something, it's gone forever. And then as you do that, each time you compare, you choose the better, eliminate the other until you get down to your final option. And so that's kind of the way of doing it. You trick yourself into feeling like you're getting the better and then you get rid of the other one so you don't think about it ever again. And that's how you drive to a, a overcoming FOBO in a major decision.